Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a really exciting uh, professional learning session sponsored by the Maine Department of Education. This is a really uh, unique collaboration between uh, technology, uh, digital learning, and visual and performing arts, uh, spoke, focusing probably mostly on, on uh, visual arts today uh, as it relates to the topic. Um, but we're going to be talking about maker spaces, and uh, this, this session came about from uh, my digital learning uh, colleague, Jonathan Graham, uh, who's going to introduce the rest of the panelists in just a second. Um, but John and his and our colleague, Emma uh, Banks, reached out to me and said, hey, for Youth Art Month, which is, which is the month that's just ending, uh, could we uh, put together a technology and art session uh, to try to spark people's interest uh, in, in collaboration uh, across content areas? And I said, absolutely. And so they proposed... Uh, talking about maker spaces, and I said, I think that's a fantastic avenue to take. So uh, we were able to get some fine panelists that have uh, great experience with maker spaces in their schools uh, to join us today. And so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Graham. Um, normally during these sessions, we have anybody, I mean, we're a fairly small group today, so I would encourage anyone to just uh, turn your microphone on and ask a question. Uh, if it's usually easier if there's a big crowd to put questions in the chat, but I don't think we necessarily need to do that. But um, and then uh, we'll have a, an exit ticket at the end uh, for you all, and um, which John, I'll take care of that, and um, that'll also uh, provide everybody with a um, uh, certificate for attendance today at today's session. So I'll turn it over to John and have him introduce the rest of our panelists. Hi, everybody. As Jason said, my name is John Graham, and I'm the Elementary Digital Learning Specialist. So I sit on the MLTI team, and this is a topic I was really interested in pursuing. I actually was part of a discussion through Mazel with Courtney, which is how I kind of brought her into this, into this mix. And I had visited Nicole's schools and worked with Kern years ago, so it was team of people that I thought could share some really good experiences and great resources. So in the presentation that we have together, there'll be stuff in there. We can share that at the end of that is at the end of this presentation as well. So if you're interested in accessing the, anything on there, you'd be able to access that um, as a future time. I have a feeling that some people this point in the school year are a little burnt and they might want to re- uh, we look at maker spaces at a later time. So I think this will be a nice evergreen session to put together for people. Um, and she may be hopping on at some point, but Emma Marie Banks is my secondary counterpart. And she is also the um, computer science specialist as well, the department. So I'll pull up that presentation so you can see that. And our panelists. So our three panelists that we have, Courtney Graffius, who does technology integration at Scarborough Schools. Nicole Hughes is a STEM teacher at the Dorm Community School within RSU 5. And Kern Kelly does technology integration in RSU 19 in Central Maine. So I think just kind of for a starting point, um, we looked in a few different places trying to find some good definitions to work off of. I think people have different interpretations of what a makerspace is and what it includes. So I thought we really liked this one for kind of framing the work that we're going to be doing today. So makerspaces are collaborative learning environments where people come together to share materials and learn new skills. They're not necessarily born out of a specific set of materials or spaces, but rather a mindset of community, partnership, collaboration, and creation. So I think all of these dovetail nicely into work that can happen across a variety of curriculum and a variety of maker spaces. So just to kind of look at a couple different maker spaces. So they tend to fall into two broader categories, mobile maker spaces, which some of our panelists have experience with, and maker spaces as a destination. So an actual physical room that students would go to um, those are kind of the two models that we see. So I want to open up to our panelists and they can kind of jump in as they see fit. Just maybe what is your experience with one of these two models and kind of what are some of the positives, negatives, anything like that that you think would be important for someone to know? 
So we have uh, here in R219 in the Comus uh, area, we actually have both kind of models. We have a, a space, we have two spaces, one for the middle school and one for the high school that people could go. And we also have portable uh, units or sets or, or, or things. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, and my opinion, as far as uh, integration and so forth, any time that we can make it portable and have the technology or the, the creation tools go to the teacher, I think it's better off. It's a less, less of an ask for a teacher to have something roll into their classroom and to, to use uh, different than the, them taking their class and so forth and going to it. Now, some equipment doesn't, doesn't uh, adhere to that, right? Like it's, you know, there's a reason why we have an art room and a phys ed room, you know, gym and that kind of stuff. So sometimes you do have to go to the equipment, but um, ideally if as much uh, portable as possible, I think that's a, that's a good model to have. Thank you, Karen. And um, from an elementary perspective, I'm in three primary schools in Scarborough. Um, and we, uh, we have had both mobile maker spaces as well as maker space as a destination. Um, and, and one of the reasons that we've had the mobile maker spaces is because of our space issues. We don't have enough room in order to dedicate uh, um, a location for a maker space. So we took it on, on wheels. Um, in, in our primary schools, I have noticed that our teachers our classroom teachers do like to bring their kids to an actual destination of the makerspace um, because there are some more uh, areas that kids can set up that are um, clear of supplies and that they can store their supplies. It also kind of has this energy, I think, for kids when they walk in that it's someplace different and it's a different um, type of work environment than what they're used to in their classroom. So, um, so we have done both. And, um, uh, and I, I think that it can, both of them can have um, great advantages. And I know, Nicole, um, I, I actually got to go to your space, yeah. which was a beautiful <laughs> space to see. Yeah, um, so my um, setup is I actually am a STEM teacher. So um, we have a makerspace as destination. Um, and um, all of our students in pre-K through eighth grade come through my space um, once a week. Um, it rounds out to be once a week-ish. Um, and it's great to be able to have them come into the space. Um, like the other panelists are saying, it kind of creates a new energy, a different dynamic than just being in their regular classroom. Um, I guess it, the only disadvantages are space is definitely an issue when there's that many ongoing projects with that many different classes. And I think there's also sometimes the mindset that because it's a separate destination, it doesn't always fit into the regular classroom. So I would personally like to see a little bit of both, I think is a winning combination. Both you can go and have it be in your regular classroom, but also have it be this place and this space where you can get to use these different tools that um, like Bert was saying aren't as portable. Um, on a cart. Yeah. Thank you. So I did have kind of a couple pieces in here. And I think this echoes some of what you just heard, some of the, the positives, some of the challenges. And then I think the one thing that I, I hadn't heard mentioned, but I think I'd heard this um, in the Maslow presentation about makerspaces, which those who are librarians, so they were talking very much from a librarian perspective. And they talk a lot about themes. If you have like mobile themed carts, or boxes or something like that. So this creation station one that I have pictured on there is kind of an example of, of a cart that they have that they can set up with a theme that they could wheel out to a classroom. So I thought that was kind of a cool, cool model as well, especially at the elementary level. And there's a nice, nice shot of a, a large maker space. So um, kind of moving on to talking about collaboration. So I think one of the big things that can make a makerspace work in you know, very unique ways is if you can bring in a wide variety of people, kind of the more the merrier. So kind of going through this list, um, what are some things that either people running a makerspace or if people have been working with teachers actively, you know, if they're coming into your space and there's sort of that expectation that they're coming in and that they're there, what are some of the things that we can do to kind of increase those integrated learning experiences? So the space is more, you know, active and involved and maybe bridging different areas of curriculum. 
I think uh, the integrator or the, the whoever is in that role really needs to be proactive about uh, going to the teachers and saying, hey, what are you working on right now for a unit or for a lesson? Um, and then uh, sometimes I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been doing integration for about 15 years and I initially thought that I could go into the classroom and say, cool, you're doing it this way, how about this way? And what I realized was I could take that same content, whatever they're, they're working through, go create an example with students of what it could look like and bring it back and then almost 100% of the time, they're like, yeah, yeah, next time, that's what we want to do. Um, but they kind of have to, a lot of times, they have to see it in action, it, whether if it's a physical thing or whatever the product is. Um, and then take it, and then they'd run with it, of course. You know, teachers would use that as a model. But I think it was kind of a, a stretch to take, you know, sometimes take what they're doing already and, like, add another layer to it. Yeah, one of the ways that um, that we've had success at the primary schools is um, is similar to what Kern said, seeing what their curriculum is and designing some um, instruction that kids can participate in um, in the in the maker space. So we use Lucy Calkins units of study in um, in our elementary schools for writing and for reading. And one of them in second grade is um, about it, it has a force in motion in it. And so the kids, uh, we, we designed um, some design challenges for students to come into the makerspace and make some um, products in order to um, make that highlight that scientific and engineering piece of the curriculum rather than just um, having the writing piece be a focus. So. Uh, I think that that, um, that integration and finding that intersection is really important for, um, for, for teachers. And, and certainly once that happens, the kids are hooked and so glad to be able to be doing hands-on activities um, in the makerspace or in the mobile makerspace. Mm -hmm. um, kind of piggybacking off um, what Courtney and Kern are saying, um, I kind of do collaboration in two ways in my space. The first is the way they identified um, teachers might come to me with a specific question, like our pre-K teacher, for example, does a big unit on birds um, with her class in the spring. And so um, I've come up with some different activities that I do to kind of align with that curriculum in my space when her pre-K class um, comes. Um, we experimented with some different types of bird feeder design and putting different things out and observing um, the changes in the bird's behavior. Um, but another way that we collaborate um, at my school, um, all of our specialists, so our art teacher, our librarian, our um, PE teacher, and our music teacher, um, several times a year, we do um, integrated units amongst ourselves. Um, so we will choose a topic. So for example, um, with our sixth graders, last year we did an around the world unit. Um, and so each teacher, in the special area um, connects to that theme in their content um, area. So in this unit, each group of students was studying a different country. So in music, they might be learning um, traditional music or instruments from that country. Um, and we kind of build students content knowledge throughout those rotations as they come to see us. Um, that's been a really fun way to collaborate. Um, and the art teacher and I often will um, kind of sync up our projects so that they might start something with her or begin something with her that then can get incorporated into a project that they're going to be making um, with me. And those collaborations are really fun because those are people who kind of know the world of being a specialist teacher um, and we can kind of create our own content topics that might not be covered in the regular curriculum that kids are getting. So I think those are fantastic examples. I'm kind of curious, yeah. that shifting into the next one. So if we're speaking to an art, you know, an art teacher audience, you know, how might those examples help kind of emphasize the collaboration? I think that's kind of the transition we've had uh, from, you know, STEM to STEAM, the idea of the arts as, as another angle of what you're doing. Um, and so we've, uh, a lot of the work that we've done as far as projects that kids have worked on or, or things they're producing, um, that's always been kind of an overlying when you're all done, whatever this thing you're creating, okay, how are you going to present that to somebody else? How are they going to, how is another person going to, you know, uh, to utilize that whole design thinking model? Um, and so I think that that's something that once you start just kind of doing it initially, um, kind of, you know, uh, on purpose and really paying attention to that, that after a while, it just becomes built into what you're creating. I'll, I'll 
I'll hop in, John, here just a second, because I, I included a couple resources here too. And I think this speaks both to increasing integrated learning experiences and emphasizing collaboration in, in maker spaces. Um, I included these two resources here. One is the principles of artistic design, uh, which again, I think it, it's these, both of these resources in my mind were intended to help to continue to build a common language between a visual arts teacher and someone who runs a makerspace because with that common understanding and, and for visual arts educators to know that principles of artistic design and, and the eight studio habits of mind, whether a maker, someone who runs a makerspace, an integrator um, goes at that purposefully or not, um, they're really great. Both of those are really great documents to help build that common language. Um, and I think that that can help facilitate uh, easier collaboration. Um, when you're working with with understanding that there are visual art components that that exist in a steam environment like Kern just suggested. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I'll share the example when we were um, having students built build structures, they turned out to be cars or things with wheels in order to, um, to, to go down a ramp and see how far they could go down. The kids talked about, asked the question of, does it matter how it looks? So that was not part of the design challenge, but for some kids, it really was, it, it really did matter, like the aesthetic piece of it. And so that, um, that is a piece that I think that, that, that certainly as a, as a tech coach, I don't know as much about as the art teacher and could see some, some great collaboration opportunities with an art teacher. Yeah, I would kind of echo that thought. Um, I think like we call them design challenges for a reason when we're in the maker space because the design portion is such a significant part of that task. And I think just emphasizing that planning, that visual, whether you're making a plan by drawing um, or making like a digital plan, um, I think that is potentially really right, um, really right for collaboration just because that design and that thinking ahead of time is so essential to success on these challenges that we're giving kids in maker spaces. I think too, it's an opportunity for certain students, maybe at the upper levels, I suppose the younger levels as well, but um, we found some of the projects we're working on different kids had different aptitudes that they were more interested in. So uh, the last project we worked on uh, a robotics unit that once it was really into the design, you know, the aesthetics of it, the, the color scheme, that kind of stuff. So that was her focus. And just because in the bigger team, another student was an engineer, another student was, uh, you know, did video production, whatever. And they kind of came together as a team and each kind of had their own expertise, which they wanted to. So they actually worked out really, really well. So I think kind of shifting into that, that last bullet point that we have there, getting kids excited about creating. So I think, one of the things that can be probably a challenge for our teachers at times is you have certain students that, you know, it can be difficult to get them engaged with the content, get them excited about it. And I'm curious if, you know, working in those maker spaces, what is kind of the maybe different energy that you might see with kids? So they seem like they're excited, maybe they're particular kids that maybe don't seem engaged in other things that they're doing, but something about the hands-on work that they're doing in that space, it seems to get them kind of more excited, more engaged, that might be leveraged into an art, an art version of a maker space, I could say. Oh, we wanted the, uh, so you remember the old TVs and the TV would roll in on the big carts, <laughs> the big heavy, you know, seat RT, whatever. So we have the same thing going for our, our 3D printer. So that rolls into the classroom, the kids all, yay, you know, it's, it's the same kind of vibe uh, was the old fashioned VCR setups. And, and that was kind of the idea is that um, if you have a project uh, or whatever you're working on, it doesn't really matter, whatever you're working on, if there's an element that we can roll in the, the components you need for those kids to, your students to, to, to take it even further, to do that creation component of it, um, we will do so. And so uh, we've been fortunate enough in the, the new building that we're in this year um, to be able to have that. And, and literally they've been all over the place. Now this year, obviously it's weird, uh, just the, the way that it's been, you know, we don't have many kids in the room at a time, but um, we still have a lot of success with, um, with that kind of model. 
Um, I think for me, I see engagement with my students really skyrocket when the project we're working on is connected to the real world or something that they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And then similarly to what Kern was just saying, when there's kind of that like tangible takeaway or that item that you're making and you're going to get to take it with you. I find even when it's like a project that uses like Q-tips and popsicle sticks and pipe cleaners, if the kids get to take it with them, they're super excited about bringing home those items that they probably had at home anyway. But they're like, look at the way I made this bridge. Um, so I think just kind of having that tangible connection to something that is kind of rooted in a real world, something that they care about um, really drives engagement for me in my space. And I'll, I'll add to what these folks have said that um, being able for kids to come in and be hands on, like John said, and be able to move around in a way that they are that they don't in the classroom as much um, where they might be collaborating on a project with a couple of kids two three kids together. Um, and they can choose what type of space works for works well for them, whether it's a, a seat uh, at a table or if it's on the floor. Um, so there's there's a lot of flexibility for them about how they can work together, as well as what what they can choose. So the design process is, it, that we walk them through is just so open ended um, that they really need to engage every every one of them in order to. Um, be able to um, pursue that whole process. Uh, and so it, it's not like, it, they've gotta be engaged in thinking. The, the thinking's not done already for them of like, this is, this is what it needs to look like. It's really open-ended um, and the, the ownership is, is really with them. So I think that that is, uh, is something that is really exciting for them. And I think for kids who um, are used to being really, um, top-notch students and can follow the model and like get to it sometimes it's hard because it's really out of the box type of thinking um and they don't know what it's supposed to look like because it, there's not anything in particular that it needs to look like so that can be a little bit harder for for those kids um and challenges them um, so i think that those are are all pieces that make it excite make kids excited about creating and also have some different experiences to how what they have in the in the regular classroom. I, I, it, oh, sorry. I, I was gonna say I agree with what Courtney was saying regarding choice and just them being able to not make what you were saying like that cookie cutter um, design and I feel like in the beginning when I'm start when I started working with students on building some of those mindsets similarly to what you were sharing students, uh, some students have a difficult time with that or don't believe you when you tell them like, really, this just needs to meet this goal. Like it can look any way that you want. Or I love to encourage students to look for loopholes, for example, and like how they can use a particular material. Um, and I think just once they kind of get the hang of it and get into that new way of thinking, it's very liberating for them compared to sort of the way that their rest of their school day is so structured. And even when it seems open-ended, it's still very much like you need to write this particular type of writing or do this math problem. Um, so choice is great. Yeah, and I think how both of them, uh, Nicole and Courtney mentioned how important it is for how being authentic and that can be hard because you're looking for real things, problems to solve uh, and that are scalable. And so one of the things we do, we introduce uh, 3D printing and modeling in fifth and sixth grade generally. And they um, kind of the, the first thing that all the kids want to do is, oh, great, I can 3D print anything. Can I 3D print my own iPhone case or whatever their phone is? Um, and so our, our rule of thumb is in the, in the school is something for us, something for you. So you can earn print time to print basically whatever you want than reason. Um, but to earn that print time, you have to go solve a problem in the school with that printer. And so initially we get a lot of door stops and a lot of, you know, teacher bathroom passes, but eventually we start getting things like I've had, uh, uh, you know, kids like they become problem finders. They start looking for things to solve and it becomes a mindset that they're actively I had one fifth grader. And it's so great because I mean, the, the, the creativity imagination you come up with was just off the wall things I would never think of. And of course we talk about if that's feasible or not, but that mindset, that shift to going from, okay, I'm just passively taking this in versus no, no, I'm looking for problems to solve every day, all day, so I can earn that print time. That's a real thing. And then once you start seeing a couple students earn that and they print out, I don't know what, a little Yoda pep figure or whatever they want, that's even more incentive for them to keep more. And so we've had, especially up at the high school level, uh, some real innovative type of things that kids have created.
Kern, can you give an example of what the kids have created for the school that's not door stops and bathroom passes? I sure can if you give me one second. <laughs> um, he's, while he's, he's gonna go grab, grab stuff. Yeah, while he's grabbing I love the show and tell portion of the, uh, of the program. This is great. Um, I would also just throw in um, uh, another space where I've been able to find time for these types of activities is in the after school space, which is another way to like as an art teacher, if you wanted to kind of dabble in this type of thing, um, the after school space maybe can feel less threatening because it just feels looser in general. Um, but I run an after school club called Makers Gonna Make. And similarly to what Kern is saying, it's kind of this open ended this is your time to create like the closets are open do what you want um and it's really amazing to see the kinds of things that kids are really intrinsically motivated to create and also the kids that choose to sign up and come are always kids that i'm not expecting will want to engage so. and i can piggyback off that and say when i was at a school and we purchased 3d printers it was so much easier to convince the art teacher hey let's do like a club after school Kids can come in for you know a certain number of sessions, and we can go through the whole designing and printing process. As opposed to, you know, when can I find that time during your regular classroom day? Interrupt your curriculum, and that seemed to work really well. And then you get a kind of cohort of kids that they have that knowledge, and they're so excited to kind of spread their enthusiasm. So this is a um, this is probably my best example of a student um, kind of solving a real world problem and and I I don't want to take too much time doing the whole story but I'll give you the the Cliff Notes version um, a couple of years ago probably five years ago now um, maybe six we had a student that was homebound um, she was um, per perfectly capable but she had uh, illnesses so she couldn't be physically at school now now that's everybody right but back then that was pretty unique um, and so she would use we actually got a grant to get this device right here this is a double robot. It's a little robot that drives around and she would pilot that to go to class to class. Uh, basically think of a Segway with an iPad on the top. And so she had a camera and she would go to class and she would uh, you know, interact. And, and if, you, if you're interested, I can have John put in, um, there is a, we have a video that we created just explaining the whole, the whole thing. It's about, I don't know, 10 minutes long or so. Um, so it was great. It was great activities, great thing for students. Everybody you know, loves seeing Jasmine. She would go to class to class and would interact with her in the whole thing. Um, but one thing we found was um, the students would get very comfortable with the robot going down the hallway very quickly. Initially, it was a you know, new brand new thing. And within a couple of weeks, they would just see it rolling down and they would walk very close to it, like you know, in the hallway going from class to class. And, and as you can see, or maybe you can't see, it's just a black bar as far as the, um, you know, the body of it. And so, uh, and she, when you're looking at it, you're just looking from the iPad camera. So you can't really, you don't have a lot of peripheral vision. And so talking to a couple of our students, these are eighth grade girls uh, at the time and said, hey, how, what can we do to fix this? Um, and so we you know, brainstormed the whole thing and they came up with the idea of creating this. This is a 3D printed model that would act basically as a um, hanger system for a t-shirt. And that would be light enough to, to hang and that would give it a little bit of width so as it went down the hallway and they also let her let them dress it up so they could like put different, you know, different shirts of the week and whatever. And so that was cool. And everybody had a great time with that. Um, and we ended up actually, the two girls got contacted by the company, Double Robotics, um, who asked them to buy the patent for um, their design. Um, and so they ended up selling it to the company to be able to give to other, just the files to other um, children and students or whatever around the country that were kind of in a similar boat. Uh, and so that's the type of thing where, you know, just looking at a real problem that one of their fellow classmates had, you know, how can we solve this? You know, what tools do we have at our disposal? Kind of working backwards and, and yeah. Um, I have an artifact I can share as well. Um, this fall um, with my seventh and eighth grade students, um, it was nice um, to have them in a smaller cohort to be able to kind of dive in um, deeply on a 3D printing project. Um, and they were tasked with developing some kind of tool, implement something that would um, somehow improve either like the experience of wearing a mask or just something related to the whole pandemic situation. Um, and I had one student um, come up with the idea. Um, she designed and printed um, this. So what this is, is it's you hold it like this um, and it can be a button presser and also a door opener so that you don't have to come into contact yourself with the surfaces. Um, and this was an awesome thing. I was actually um, pregnant in the last part of the pandemic or the last 
part of the year. And I just was able to use this every time I went to the doctor's appointment. So it's just really great to just be able to have her design this printed and then give her feedback on it as I was using it um, in my own life. <laughs> I saw a brief flash from the chat, but I didn't get a chance to get that open to see if we had a- That was just me, John. I was just throwing in a um, the link for that video. Perfect, thank you. So I like, and I think 3D printing is a great example because it kind of ties together technology, but also something that's very physical and tangible. And I think for, hopefully for a lot of art teachers, they can kind of see the potential in something like a 3D printer. And of course they're all over the state because of the Perlar Family Foundation. So that's a great resource, which we did list in our resource. That might be kind of a nice thing to, to jump, a, um, jump ahead a couple slides, but just to, I wanted to make sure it in here, sometimes we have people that might be, yeah, that sounds great, but where do I get this stuff? So mm. I added a few different things in there. I don't know if other people have some suggestions of how maybe they've acquired things within their district, maybe just some strategic ways to go about that. We use in Scarborough, um, Ruth's reusables in re recyclables, um, which is a, an organization that uh, um, companies donate to, um, donate excess materials to and there is an assortment of supplies there that can be used for making and we do we do not uh, at k2 do um, too much with uh, digital printers um, um, 3d printers excuse me but um, but more um, creating and 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 sticking things together and um, kind of that physical piece of it. So we we do get a lot of our materials right from there, and we've also had um, really good success when there are supplies we can't get from there in uh, collaborating with our PTO for supplies. They're huge supporters of the makerspace movement. Um, I would also say um, a lot of the stuff can kind of be just like crowdsourced from your colleagues too. Like I feel like it's just now known in my school that I will take anybody's random junk. Um, and so I all the time have people saying like, oh, I digitized all these things. I don't need these CDs anymore. Do you want them? Sure. Like we'll use them for wheels for a car or something that we're making. Or one time I needed a lot of shoe boxes and it was around the holidays and everybody brought me all their new shoe boxes. Um, so it's just also, so if there are things that are easy to find, you can just oftentimes collect them from your community of colleagues or even your broader school community. And John, before we get too far away from some of the other stuff we were talking about, I just want to go back really quick to the, the 3D printer and the visual art concept and like how how is it a, a, a great way to kind of make that connection and that entryway into a visual arts classroom? And I will tell you back back in the old days when we could actually go into schools, um, I was making the rounds around the state and talking with my visual arts colleagues and I said, we talked about 3D printers and I asked them if they had engaged any of that in their classroom and some of them, some of them rebuffed it and said, well, no, that's, you know, we do, we do other things in here and I said, well, so you, you cover sculpture and they said, sure, you know, but we use clay and they'd show me their clay setup and everything and I said, so let's talk about why the use of programming into it and using a 3D printer to create a sculpture is not still having an artist doing the work to create the piece. And for many of them, that was really, that was really eye-opening for them. And I think they just hadn't made that connection yet. So we're still on the, the cusp of a lot of these things just being new that, that we're trying to figure out how to make those extensions out to other content areas. And, you know, when we're talking about visual arts and and sculpture, and that's not just for the for the 3D printers, but I think about um, like the use of old CDs and things like found items. I'll tell you, there are a lot of teachers that this year uh, with the pandemic have been reverting to a lot of really fantastic, engaging um, found items sculptures, and and many of them have been challenged to incorporate a technology uh, component in there as well. So you know, there's just another great connection about trying to open the door uh, to a new way of thinking in, in integrating technology and arts together. 
Yeah, I think to, to piggyback on that, like too, to me, what's getting most excited at the upper level, if if the middle school level has uh, grades, you know, and younger elementary and so forth, that experiential learning piece where the students have exposed to all kinds of different types of technologies and integrated and so forth, whatever. So by the time they get to upper middle school level or maybe high school level, they can start taking all the different pieces that they've been exposed to and putting them together to start creating things that kind of more than a sum of their parts. Um, that to me, uh, more so than, you know, like uh, 3D printing for 3D printing sake or or robotics or coding or any of these things in a silo, we start building these things together and, and creating uh, you know, products that are, are you can only do if you have a little piece of all these things. That to me is super exciting. Um, I'll give you an example. This is one that we've been working on, um, still very much prototype, but I know my, my high school students are working on a tabletop cleaner uh, to save our teachers time. <laughs> and so the idea, of course, right now, you know, COVID, et cetera, all the sanitation time. Um, so this incorporates, this is, I don't know, I think this is Mach 3 or something version, whatever it is. Um, but the idea being that, you know, there's robotics, of course, there's coding, of course, there's 3D printing for custom chassis, of course, uh, there's design and, and, and graphic elements to it, but it's not any of those things. It's all of those things. It, it, it is more than a sum of its parts. It is a combination of all those uh, discrete pieces coming together uh, to form something. And that's, to me, super exciting at that upper levels where you've, you know, you've had that exposure at the elementary or maybe middle school levels. So by the time you get to high school levels, you know enough about 3D printing to know what you, you know, that it can be done or enough about coding to know what you need to do or enough about, you know, any of these pieces to bring it together to create something. Well, I think that kind of speaks to I mean, really, a lot of that is kind of building upon what you, you know, what you could have or what you might already have. I think that's why the 3D printers are such an interesting um, case in Maine is that they're just, they're so pervasive, they're everywhere. And sometimes people just aren't aware, or maybe there's that element of, well, I don't know, I don't know the software to do this or that. But it's kind of like, once you start building it, once you get that momentum, it can really be, you know, ground, I mean, it seems groundbreaking at first, but I mean, it can really change things a lot for your whole school environment as Kern has given several examples. But really once kids start seeing that and seeing their ideas come to life, it really can take on a completely transformative um, element. So we can take a, a step back. I don't know if the, anybody had any kind of other things that they wanted to share about um, I think back kind of in these collaboration pieces, if there was anything in that related to kind of some of the stuff that we were just talking about, we we're talking about resources and kind of tying that in. So some, something a little bit different, but I'm looking at this second bullet, emphasize collaboration in maker spaces. I think there's collaboration amongst um, teachers and also amongst students. Um, and that's a, that's a place where I work really hard to get the kids to be able to um, have the expectation that everyone's going to work and everyone's going to be a part of that of that process and kind of and be held accountable for for that. Um, and and so there's a lot of groundwork that we lay at the beginning. Um, in some some classes, uh, some classroom teachers have already done a lot with that, um, and others not so much. Uh, so that's something that that I always start with as as some of the um, um, grounding pieces is that we um, that we're all working together and that we're all expected to work um, and that we need to communicate with each other too as we're as we're working uh, so I think that the the collaboration is huge in maker space for teachers as well as for students um, prior to this year kind of this is making me think about this Courtney um, the um, something that we do in our specials is we actually cross students. Um, we mix the ages of our students. So I will often have a group of third and fourth graders in my space at the same time. And that's another really um, great opportunity for collaborating with some different kids that you maybe don't interact with in your daily like homeroom classroom. But it's also really ripe with opportunities for um, a fourth grader to kind of model some expertise that they may have acquired um, the previous year and share it with a younger counterpart. And I love when those kind of cross grade collaborations can happen and there are no, the third graders are no longer asking me for help, but they're asking this fourth grade peer who is there an expert in their eyes on how to do this um, task. 
Yeah, I think that's huge. I think the ability for uh, maybe older kids or whatever to work with younger kids and help them or, or make that be kind of a co-project um, of, of some kind, I think that's just a win-win for everybody. Um, obviously the service piece of it, but also the fact that, you know, they're gonna have to solve problems that they're not thought of. Um, and I also like the idea, especially our younger kids, we had uh, a couple years back, one of our kind of our Mother's Day projects were the younger kids, first graders, second graders would trace their hands um, with, with a black marker and do kind of a hand thing, almost like a, kind of like the old turkey uh, thing, just in black and white. And then our eighth grader students would take those and there's a software to be able to render those into 3D and we could 3D print th their hands or actual hands as models. We give that to, you know, to the parents. So the, the students at the younger grades, yes, they have a kind of a fun thing that they created, but also I want them to think, not to think of, you know, that uh, using these tools as, oh, I only do that during this class for 50 minutes, you know, once a week. It's just like, no, no, you're in language arts class. Sure, if it makes sense to use that, use it or whatever, you know, so these, all these tools are available whenever it makes sense. And I like the idea of kind of what Courtney and um, Nicole were saying about, you know, bringing students and getting them engaged. So they're, you know, engaging with each other. And if you can get that done across, across grades, that's fantastic. But also as much as you can get the teacher to kind of like step back and say, okay, I can be sitting in the learning seat as well as this process is going on. And I know that can be a really uncomfortable place to be when you're kind of supposed to be in control of your classroom space. But I think that's definitely one of, a, especially with technology, I think that's something people that do technology integrations, just something you have to accept is that you can't know everything about everything. And at some point, students are going to bypass you and you just have to defer to them if they have more knowledge in a specific area. And I think that when you can get to that place, it can be really exciting to see students take on those kind of roles of almost leadership that they don't often have opportunities to do within a school. Would anybody like to speak to that at all? Um, I can jump in. Um, so something that I will sometimes task um, my middle school students with um, is creating items that I'm going to use with younger students in their lessons with me. So um, an example um, is my fifth and sixth, my pre-K kids and I do an exploration related to bubbles um, and using different shapes of bubble wands and trying to just discover how the shape of the wand influences maybe the resulting bubbles that you get. Um, but I task my fifth and sixth graders with being the ones who design those wands for the kids. Um, and similarly to what you're saying, I kind of have an idea in my head of like what they're going to make or what they might end up creating. Um, and then more often than not, they will completely surpass the expectation that I had for what they were going to do, or they'll discover a new thing that you can do with the software that I didn't know. I feel like 80% of what I've learned about the software is something that a student stumbled upon and then was excited to show me. Um, so it's really fun to grow our knowledge together by kind of engaging together. And I'd like to think too, John, that as we at the department work to um, to embolden uh, teachers in all different content areas to start experimenting with collaboration, you know, as, and, and as we offer professional learning opportunities that sort of dabble in a, in a number of different content areas, my hope is that teachers, um, teachers develop enough knowledge, just enough to be dangerous and to be able to, to start to explore some of these things a little bit and that their own interest is going to be piqued by the potential of collaborating with someone with a maker space or, you know, getting multiple content areas together in a in a steam or a stem uh, type environment and seeing what can come of that so i'm excited about what the future could hold for that as well absolutely um i i, I just wanted to say something because i feel i didn't want people to think i was like a voyeur here like all silently watching and driving um i didn't really even know what this group was about i just signed up for it i was interested and i had bus duty so that's why i was late um, but I'm like totally fascinated by the conversation. I, do, I didn't know what a, I still don't know what a maker space is exactly, but I'm getting an idea. Never heard of it, but I am creepily watching you, but I'm, I'm definitely listening and thank you for, thank you for everything. <laughs> We've definitely put together some resources, Sarah. So if you want to know more about um, maker spaces, there's definitely, a, hopefully a lot of stuff. I think that was the original intent was to 
kind of share resources with people. So if they're interested. Yeah. They can, and you know, and Sarah, as as one of our resident artist people here, uh, you know, let's connect on this and see what more you want to know about it so that we can develop out some more offerings for people. Yeah, we are. Our, our, uh, we lost two of our I, we didn't lose them. They left, you know, they're, they're alive. But um, two of our older art teachers at our school and one of them was doing 3D printing. Um, you know, but but uh, was more of the tech guy, and and so yeah, for sure, I'm I'm totally interested. We're a little like over our heads with two brand new art teachers this year, but I'm so I just like to be involved in this stuff, to keep learning and hearing what's going on out there, and you know. I'll make a pitch too. I think right now, uh, uh, at some day, some day will be post pandemic. We're not there yet, but someday will be yeah. that. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of technology influx as far as, you know, what we consider technology, computers, laptops, you know, cameras, that kind of stuff. And that's great. We needed it. And we, and that's awesome. Now that we have that, or we have a good chunk of that, to me, the next, the layer on top of that, that to really use it effectively isn't just another camera on the screen. It's it's the stuff you're gonna build with your hands. And, and I think, I don't know in, in everyone else's situation, but certainly in ours, um, there's a desire, there's a need of our students to get back and to build things and, and you know touch things with their hands. And um, just doing this virtually, uh, it, it's fine. It's making it through, but it's not great. Um, whereas if we can get them back and 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 you know be able to do that next level up for me is you know you're you're creating things. Uh, you're not just consuming through a through a camera, but you're actually creating things. Um, and what opportunities can we do that for our, our existing teachers to kind of that build that culture that no no it's okay. Yes, you're going to learn from them at the same time, but you're also going to let's let's use this. Let's our hands or let's actually build something. So on this slide, I included a list of, and this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but just those that had, I, I thought pretty, you know, interesting resources or website that was built. Um, so if you're kind of interested in learning more about some of the maker spaces across the state of Maine, here are a couple examples here. I was curious to see the um, the fourth one down, Yarmouth. Um, actually, it's not even through the school so much as like through the community, but they have a makerspace camp they do every summer. I did notice that they ha are offering that this summer coming up. So that was really cool to see because I had talked with um, somebody that had been involved with that. So definitely lots of cool opportunities and lots of stuff out there and people that run these that you can connect with aside from our educators that we have here. Um, and then we also included this, some of our um, books and resources that we like that may talk to makerspace or just creative spaces and how you might integrate that in as well. So this hopefully is a resource and these are all linked. So if you wanna learn more about these, you can certainly access these. And like I said, we'll share this um, slideshow presentation out with people. If you're watching this on the DOE's YouTube channel in the future, Look down in the description. It will link you to this to this slide deck. Um, and then down below, we had some examples. Um, Nicole had a lot of examples <laughs> from her space. Um, but um, Courtney, I don't know if you wanted to kind of speak to for just a minute about the pictures that you pulled up from your spaces. Sure. Um, so I was talking a little bit earlier about the uh, flexibility that kids have in where they're working and, and with uh, working with small groups and collaborating. And you can see in the top, uh, the picture that's on the left in the top one, uh, that space that's in there, obviously pre-pandemic, we're all close together. Um, and so, so that just kind of shows it's a, it's a pretty open space that can have tables moved to the sides if we're gonna be doing something with like a bigger robot on the floor. Um, so there, the, the, there's that example, and then the bottom photo is a um, a group of kiddos working together to build. Uh, I think in this case it was an igloo, um, and you can just see how hands-on they are, and they can sit, they can stand, they can move around, um, and I think that helps to engage them. The two links that are on here. One is a learning commons or, or library and makerspace collaboration example. So we had a supply called Kiva Planks that we wanted our kids to, um, to learn about and to build with and, and explore with. And so I just uh, collaborated with a librarian in that case for teachers to come in to, um, to the space at that school to 
to build. And then the second one um, are some links to a, a fully remote kindergarten class that we have in a design challenge that we did um, called Grab Bag Design Challenge. And they were using supplies to, um, to, to really pretty much make anything they wanted. Um, and we, we did that through some live Google Meets as well as some Seesaw activities. And I linked some examples to those uh, or uh, in that document to the Seesaw activities if anyone wanted to use them or just to see them as well as to some photos of the kiddos, uh, to examples of the kids' work. So those are just some resources that I wanted to share from one of our little primary schools. Thank you so much. And Nicole, I don't know if there were any specific, but I, I liked what you did here and that you had a lot of like really grade specific activities and ideas. Are there any in particular you want me to jump to and highlight? Um, I don't know that any in particular need to be highlighted. I think just the sense was I wanted to give a look at what this could look like in a progression. Um, I think Kern was talking earlier just about how it's great when the skills can build upon each other. And so I just wanted to give a sense of like what that can look like over, you know, a elementary through middle school span. Thank you. And so that, uh, as people kind of were able to see, they're just a lot of really fantastic examples. And like she was saying, she has a progression because she has those kids year after year. So we can do all kinds of stuff and build upon those skills. Yes, it's definitely a benefit to work with the same kids for 10 years at a time and keep going. So. Absolutely. And Colonel, I'll let you share, and you have the very exciting steam steam bus that you can yes, share. Yes, our steam bus. So, uh, our, so there's a couple things going on here. One is, as I mentioned about that, those mobile carts, that's our steam roller that you can roll right into your class and there's all kinds of the bits and pieces that you need. Um, I think it should have a link under there and I thought I'll add it that goes, if anybody's interested to exactly what we have um, as far as the, the parts, I'm happy to share that. Um, and the scene bus, we do have a, a coordinating with um, EMCC and, and UTC up in Bangor. There's a big push right now and there needs to be where, um, yes, we have CTV programs at the high school level starting the junior year, but most places don't really have anything kind of formalized fifth through 10th grade. And so um, a lot of kids are starting, you know, you have to figure out your junior year. Oh, maybe I do want to do CTE now. Now, not having experienced it for many years before that. So um, our hope was, again, pre-pandemic, <laughs> we were actually, we actually get to do three of these events and then they, they get, we kind of had to, to shelve it for a little while. Um, but to actually go to schools and uh, the whole purpose of that was we actually brought a bus filled with all kinds of cool steam equipment um, and we would leave things with the teachers there, with the staff um, and, the, and, and, and show teachers uh, to basically show that integration in action. Yes, you're teaching language arts, but here's the way you can incorporate this. And yes, you're teaching science, here's the way you can incorporate this. And we also would have students as presenters. I had my students that I work with as the team that would present these topics. Um, the whole idea being that it's not a case, I don't think of um, all this stuff, you know, steam and, and makerspace, or whatever, as a special. I don't think it was a as a separate thing. I think it very much integrated to what you're already doing in your content areas. You're just doing it in such a, a little bit more hands-on way. All right. Well, thank you all, our panelists, Courtney Kern and Nicole, for sharing stuff from your different spaces that you have. I hope hopefully people looking through this, whether people that are on the call right now or people watching this in the future can draw some inf inspiration from the information that we were able to share out with people. So thank you so much. Jason, do you want to wrap this up? Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks to everyone again for sharing. I hope again that we were able to plant a seed here uh, for folks like Sarah that are going to see this after the fact and say, I want to know more about this makerspace thing. I want to know what's going on here because that's really where we can start to really have a, a, a positive impact and a positive change um, in helping our students uh, to learn, you know, a, a variety of different skills and learn how to uh, work uh, with multiple content areas at the same time and develop those 21st century skills. So thank you all so much for being here. I did put a link to an exit ticket in the chat. So if you want to grab that link before the end of the session, or if you want to save the chat, you can do either. Um, once you submit that exit ticket, it will present you with another link that will take you to a PD certificate uh, that you can slap your name on and you'll have uh, credit for having attended the session. So um, Emma, do you want to wrap us up with anything or are you just... Uh,
just rocking out waiting are you waiting for your husband to be done or is he done yes yes I was you're a, waiting for him okay <laughs> I, I was gonna say I was a failure at planning today I yeah. like loved listening to everyone sharing I think that you guys nailed it I really love hearing about the collaborative nature of maker spaces because to me that's really where they shine you know it's not it's not in a silo that they do amazing things it's when they're used in conjunction with all of these other awesome things so it's been great to listen. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Very cool. And like John alluded to earlier, this session, the recording from this session will be available on the DOE's YouTube channel uh, later on, as soon as we get it up in the, into the cloud. So um, any last questions or comments from anybody, any of our panelists or attendees? Um, I just want to say that this was my first experience hearing about makerspaces, and I am just amazed. I think they sound incredible. I've always been a huge um, fan of integrating learning experiences, and so I'm looking really forward to kind of introducing this to um, my daughter's school as a PTSA member, um, as well as um, just something to like think about for um, after school programs as well in our area. So thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing experiences. This was really great stuff. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you all again. We've reached our three o'clock time. So uh, I guess we'll see you in the future, hopefully for some more uh, great discussions about makerspaces and uh, visual arts and technology. So thank you all.